So I'm going to talk about Acros virtualization today, and, and uh, I just thought I'd mention one thing. Someone asked me to mention uh, um, I'm kind of the not Linux part of these RISC five meetings. So um, I actually can announce we got Plan 9 sort of running in user mode this morning, and one of the things I'm learning over and over is how much stuff that's sort of hidden knowledge. And the thing I found out this morning is how you set the global pointer and why it matters. So um, you know there are there are things that we need to do a little more documentation of that are sort of embedded in glibc as far as i can tell right now so it was just kind of an interesting experience i'm having and of course i do core boot and core boot does run on the low risk uh fpga bitstream and spike now so uh, anyway so the other non-linux thing i'm going to talk about is acros and a lot of the reason for this is we have developed a new virtualization model at google that runs on the acros kernel and I have been looking at that in the context of RISC V, and I'm not quite sure I know how to implement it on the RISC V. So I'm hoping people will see this talk and then give me <laughs> ideas on what I can do uh, to make it work. But since nobody knows what Acros is, uh, let me mention that first. Acros is a research kernel from UC Berkeley. About a year and a half, or almost two years ago now, we hired the guys who wrote it, and I had been working with them on it since 2013. And we've continued development of it at Google, just taking a look and seeing what we could possibly do with it. Uh, there are a lot of new ideas in Acros. Um, I'm going to focus on one, which is the multi-core process, because that's key to understanding our virtualization model. Uh, one way to think of a multi-core process is, uh, you know, everybody's probably done gang scheduling, where you take a whole bunch of cores and you got a whole bunch of processes, and you say, put those cores in a corner, and those processes own it, and don't bother it again, right? Just let it run. Um, Acros takes that a little further. The, the sort of key scheduling element in Acros is a core or set of cores, not a process as in the old Unix model. And basically, you hand that, you take that set of cores and you have this entity called a multi core process, which owns that set of cores. And in that multi core process, there's a second level scheduler or a user level scheduler, people might call it. And so the assignment of threads to cores is done in user mode in Acros, not by a kernel. Um, there are a lot of advantages to this. Uh, in Linux world, they would call this, or a lot of worlds, they would call it M to N, where N is the number of cores and M is the number of threads, and M is always much greater than N. Uh, we can get really good, clean scheduling of threads um, in this. It was originally designed for HPC, but we're finding a lot of other uses. So here's kind of our standard picture, and you can kind of see on the left, uh, there's the standard Unix model, which Linux uses. There's kind of a core and then this sort of vertical slice up through a kernel scheduler and a, and a kernel thread and then the process thread. In Acros, we've got that set of cores scheduled by um, the kernel scheduler. But instead of that vertical slice where there's a kernel thread for every, for every um, um, user thread, um, you've actually got the user scheduler managing the thread assignment to cores. And there's really no kernel component of a thread in Acros like there is in, in Unix or Linux. So we build on that model with a virtual machine. So I went to look at doing virtual machines about a year and a half, two years ago in Acros. And you know, I wanted to step back a little and kind of rethink this whole thing. And you know, the first question, what is a VM? Well, in Linux, it's always or mostly been open a dev KVM and that becomes a VM. So but that's not really a VM. That's an implementation choice, right? You don't have to do it that way. And, and we wanted to think about how VMs would fit into the Acros model with this user level scheduling. And we didn't want to take anything for granted. So Kind of first step was to sort of think about, well, what, what is a VM really? And, you know, you get a lot of argument from some of the old Unix guys at Google that, well, process is kind of a virtualization thing. So um, I decided to go back and look at how you start processes. So for those of you who have been around maybe as long as me, um, which is I'm longer than I like to admit, um, starting a process used to be an incredibly painful thing to do. So here's HP MPE from the MPE from the 70s, and don't read that, it'll give you a headache. Uh, here's the classic IBM job control language. I believe this is cat. I am not sure, but like line three, step 10, there's where you name your program. So if you want to you know, start a program, you set up your virtual card reader, and you submit your virtual card deck, and you know, it kind of runs. Uh, there's a CDC, NASTRAN uh, job deck, as they call them. Here's another kind of uh, you know, JCL for newer mainframes. Uh, all of a sudden, now it's got lots of angle brackets because it's XML. So. You know, Ken Thompson came along in the early 70s and said, you know, enough of this nonsense. Um, he created a thing called fork, okay? And to create a new process, you did a fork, and you had a new process. And not only that, 
you know, you were both there, right? After a fork, you're running at the same place, you know exactly what your state is and you can proceed. Um, starting a process before a fork was just incredibly ugly and awful thing to do. Um, we take fork for granted now. It's just very, very easy. Um, what's not remembered or realized is that was a very controversial thing to do, right? Um, Dennis Ritchie used to say, yeah, we were profligate with processes. And at the time, the idea that you would actually fork off a process to actually enumerate the files in the directory, I actually would talk to people who'd go red in the face at the idea. You know, it's inefficient, you can't do this. Starting a process, just the LS, you mean you've got a command interpreter, it's a process? This used to be a really controversial idea. Um, hard to believe and hard to remember, but really true. Let's look at virtualization today. Remember that newer mainframe slide, the XML? That's actually from libvirt. Um, and it's this tiny fraction, right? I mean, if I tried to fit the whole thing, it would have been mouse tracks. But there's this giant pile of XML that is there to define kind of how you run a VM. Um, it's a lot more complex than JCL. Time moves on and we get advanced new technologies. So we can have a 1,000 lines of XML instead of 10 lines of JCL. Um, and you know, a lot of times when you're used in the UIs, there are demons and special user IDs and batch scheduling and giant XML files and mountains of code. So to run a VM, we've recreated batch systems. And, and kind of to step back a little, how the heck do we get here with dev KVM and demons and things like that? Um, well, it kind of starts with the fact that we have a dev KVM. Now, I, I, need to, I need you all to take a little step into a zone of unreality here. I know you're not going to believe this, but there are politics in open source projects like Linux. So this is incredible but true, OK? So why did Avikivity do dev KVM? And if you go back, and it, and it kind of was like a running joke at one of the OLS conferences, um, Avi could not kind of really get along with Andy Clean, basically. And um, so he ended up making dev KVM because he was able to make an externally out of kernel source tree compilable module, compilable module that would implement KVM. That's where we start with dev KVM. We couldn't really dig down and really kind of embed it in a nice way. Um, in the kernel because people can't always get along. Well, OK, so device, how do I get to it? Well, uh, I guess I need to set your ID root thing. Well, that's a bad idea. So we got to have some demons, right? And, and so you know, it, it, if you start from the initial condition that people couldn't get along because there's people are people, we kind of end up where we are today in the Linux side of the house. And we did not want to really start that way in Acros. So I ported five different VMs to Acros to kind of evaluate things. And we were sort of unhappy with them all. Um, so the question is, why can't a VM be a thread? You know, we're really thread-oriented in Acros. Why don't I just make a VM a thread? So why can't I do this? Um, and what's going on here? OK, this is actually in one file in the source. It's for the paper we're writing. Um, this is a VM. There's the VM guest. There's the VM manager. Um, we have a struct called a virtual machine. You can tell them I'm nervous because the laser pointer is shaking. Um, and in the, in the main, basically, we do a vthread adder init. This is designed to look like pthreads, because everybody knows how to do pthreads. So we do a vthread adder init with a VM struct, and the attributes are zero. We can have other attributes. Then we do a vthread create. And the parameters are the VM struct. We have to have that. That's one difference from vthreads. And then zero is like the nth VM, so VM zero. We give it a pointer, and we give it an arg, which is null. And that's all we do. We're running a VM at that point. We're running a VM that shares our address space in which we can manage. The VM is really complicated. It counts to 100,000 in exits. It does a VM call. Uh, the fun part about running a VM is like a thread, is you do a VM joint or thread joint by doing a halt instruction. You're allowed to do that because you're in guest string zero, OK? So there is you know, a virtual machine, and there is the VM manager all in one file. And it's that easy to start up a VM in Acros now. VMs are threads, uh, to recap. You know, Acros processes and threads aren't really the kind of thing we've been used to for 45 years in Unix. It's, it's sort of a different thing, because a process in Acros is this thing that gets scheduled onto a bunch of reserve cores. And then that thing, once scheduled, has a second level scheduler in user mode that actually activates the threads on the cores. And we call that popping a context. Um, so we basically just extended the thread model. And now there are two ways you can start a thread. You can start a thread in traditional ring three, which is really ring one on an AMD 64, or you can start it in what we call ring V, V for virtual. 
And that's the basic idea. So we've been running Linux for about a year. We've got a 12-line patch to Linux where we basically say to Linux, by the way, your clock is running at this rate, so you don't need to spend a couple of seconds trying to figure out what the clock rate is here, right? You're a guest in a VM. We don't, you don't need to work that out. We'll tell you. Um, and we also have kind of this Dune mode where we can run a, we can run a piece of code, arbitrary code, and guest ring zero. Um, the guests run their own page tables. It's just a standard kind of you know, host a kernel environment. So here's one example. There's 10 threads, and five of them are running as VMs, ring V, and five of them are running in ring three, and they can pop back and forth. I don't really show that in the example, um, but you can flip. And there's a shared address space between them. Now, you will say to me, wait a minute, I don't want Linux running and, and, and tromping all over the address space of virtual machine manager, and that's absolutely true. So we kind of don't let the guests out of this small 2 to the 46 byte address space. So they kind of have to live down there, right? And then, you know, we give an extra bit, and the Ring 3, you know, virtual machine manager has the option of living in the high part of a 2 to the 47th byte address space. So it's pretty easy to protect this stuff from that because it can't get to it. And MMAP and Acros, when you do an MMAP for anonymous memory, it actually defaults to mapping it up there. It assumes kind of that you're a VMN. You can force it to be down here, obviously, but it, you know the default is to be up here. Uh, because we have to run 8086 stuff, um, and because of limitations in the GCC toolchain, it's still really hard in GCC to build things that don't kind of run in the small model. Uh, that's also true on RISC-V. I've been having troubles with that. I hope we can talk about it later. But code in a low 16 meg, so we wall that off from the VM. Uh, except for one meg, because, of course, we are running things that run on x86, and the one meg is sacred space to anything that runs on an x86. There's all kinds of tables and stuff you need down there. So we really integrate the threads tightly into the kernel. Um, I'll get to the paging stuff in a minute. You can enter the kernel from a VM, or you can enter the kernel from a syscall, and the path is actually pretty much the same. Okay. It's, it's a thread that's in a multi-core process that decided it needed to do something, and it blew out, of the, blew out of the VM or blew out of the ring three and went down. Could be because you took a page fault. It's handled the same way in a VM or in a, in a process or a thread. Could be other reasons. Um, at some point, it's time to return from the kernel to user. You can return via a VM enter, which gets you into ring V, or you can return via an I, you know, RET, IRET, which gets you into ring three. There actually were no architecture independent changes to, to make that all work. And uh, Barrett went ahead. Barrett's kind of the key guy on Acros. Um, he went ahead and added a user-level scheduler that's really oriented to running this VM model. So I just want to give one example, because this, to me, this is one of the ones I don't know how to do on RISC-V. Um, if you look at sort of paging in Linux for virtual machines, so a virtual machine mapping of virtual machine physical to host physical goes through a page table-like thing called the EPT. Um, you're going to love this. The EPT is an titanium format page table. Don't ask me why they did this. They did. It's actually arguably a better format, but my god, you know, we, we're on an x86, and we decide that for this one critical thing, we're going to change the format of page table entries. I don't understand. But in any event, so here's a process on the left, and it has a CR3 process root and the standard walkthrough four-level page table. Here's a virtual machine on the right that's got an EPT root walkthrough four-level page table. And everything's different in, in the code about what handles this, right? All different things. So what we did in Acros is we paired them. So a process root, remember, these threads are VMs or they're, they're, they're process ring three type threads. So they share this, and when you're running as a virtual machine in ring five, your root is that thing on the right, and when you're running as a process in ring three, your root is that thing on the left. And you still traverse those, and what you do is you pair the page table pages. So the low page is for sort of running as a process, and the high page in that pair is for running as a virtual machine. If I fault on a page in a virtual machine, I walk down there, and if I want to get some idea of what the process is going to let me do, I subtract 4K, from the address of the page table entry, and I can see what the, the host page table page is. This is just, this actually got implemented in an afternoon. It was so damned easy to do, and it immediately cleaned up the whole problem of managing paging from virtual machines and processes. This is great. I don't know how to do it um, because the RISC V model is this sort of very, very strict hierarchy machine, hypervisor, supervisor, process. I don't really know how to do a thing 
it's kind of a VM, but has a lower level privilege than the operating system that it's running with. So again, people can correct me about maybe how that can work. Um, it's, it's just something I don't understand. Now, when I enter the kernel, so my VM takes a fault, right? It, it, it references VM physical memory that it shouldn't or whatever, or it does something in Intel land called a VM call, a lot of things. Uh, it does something it's not supposed to be doing. Or I'm in ring three and I do a system call or I take a page fault or whatever. I enter the kernel, okay? Now, in KVM, when a VM enters the kernel, an IOCTL system call finishes and a virtual machine manager has to kind of look at this thing. And then it kind of has to poke around the VM and try and figure out what the heck. Um, in the Acros model, basically, um, you, you exit just like a thread would exit. And then the, the kernel can actually tell the second level scheduler, because second level scheduler is involved in thread scheduling, this thread just exited, what do you want to do? And at that point, a VMM can kind of pick up and look and see what's going on. Or even more interestingly, and I've written this, you exit from the VM, you drop to the kernel, the fault is reflected to you running as ring three, because remember, there was that code that was in high memory, high virtual address, and a code that was the VM. So we bounce out of the virtual machine to the kernel, bounces up to the user level scheduler, which says, okay, I'm going to run you as a ring three process, and it just resumes you in that process mode. So it, it turns out to be ridiculously easy to write VMs. And I've written about 10 VMMs at this point on Acros. Um, and, and I was looking. I believe there have only been two VM managers written in the 10 years that KVM has been out. First one was written by Avi and his guys and integrated into QEMU. The second was by Pekka Engberg. It's a wonderful piece of code called the KVM tool. But it's actually a lot of work to write virtual machine managers in the Linux model, because you've got to muck with these ioctals, and it just gets tricky. It's real, real easy in Acros. So you can enter from ring three via trap system call page fault, or you can enter from a VM via VM exits, VM call, and EPT fault, stuff like that. But the handling in a kernel actually isn't really much different. So this slide is a little complicated. I think I'll, we can talk about this offline. So the, the summary here, and, and, and this is like my concern, Acros VMs aren't like VMs on BSD or Linux or whatever. They're really different, because a VM is really just a thread. Right? It's a thread running in a certain mode. So normally, you exit a kernel, you go into user mode. In Acros, you exit a kernel, and you either go into user mode or ring V. Okay? And, and there isn't a lot that the kernel does that really makes that very much different. Um, it's really easy to switch from being a VM to, to being in a host thread. And to really make this work, we invented this new mode called uh, ring V. Um, we've also found that. Um, Vert.io communications is super easy, and then we've run into a problem with the way Vert.io is implemented. Uh, you know, the Linux implementation of Vert.io really is very, very heavy on VM exits. So you do almost anything with a Vert.io ring, you're going to exit the VM and let someone pick it up and manage it for you. So we're working on these interrupt-free Vert.io or VM exit-free Vert.io ring implementations now. Um, we're actually working on the SMP part of this now, and we're basically probably going to make spinning up an extra core look like a CPU hot plug event to Linux. OK, so you know, how do we do this paging thing that we're trying to do on RISC-V? I don't actually understand how to do that, right? Because we, we have this parallel structure. Um, but again, in, in a RISC-V model, the hypervisor sort of contains the supervisor. And in our model, well, not quite like that, because a, a, a virtual machine in our model is just another facet of a process. Um, so can ring three pop into a VM mode? Um, one thing it'd be nice to find out, Intel has this just gigantic amount of state, because a lot of the parts of the architecture don't actually virtualize correctly. So when you enter a VM in an x86, you've got to find all the things that didn't virtualize and dump them in this thing called the VMCS. Then you enter the VM. When you exit the VM, um, you have to sort of dump some amount of partial state into the VMCS. And then the really painful thing is you ever say, disconnect the connection between the core and the VMCS. That's super expensive, because that's where stuff actually maybe really makes its way to memory. It's like a cache flush of 4K, line, 4K bytes. Um, so we'd like to ensure that we don't end up with these giant balls of state that, that happen when you enter and leave a VM. But again, in a current Acros model, well, hypervisors are supersets of kernels. So it's, it's almost not even a question. And, and you know, what about interrupts? Um, we have now a way to inject interrupts into our ring V 
threads without having them exit. So we've got exit-free interrupt injection. That's a long story with Intel. I'll be glad to tell over a beer sometime. That was interesting. Um, we really want to be able to do IPIs between guests without doing exits. And the, the current IPI mechanism in Risk Five, as far as I know, is still an SBI call. And you may know from me on the mailing list, I'm not a super fan of the whole SBI idea for other reasons. But um, I don't know. I'd like to be able to do that somehow. Um, devices and topology. Um, the uh, current way of enumerating devices from a VM is pretty awful on x86. It'd be nice if it were, I, I mean, I like the config string. It'd be nice if that's kind of how we do it. Um, so one of, this is, I guess, the editorial part, right? Um, so I'm the not Linux guy, okay? And I'm not, I'm trying not to be the x86 guy. Um, you know, as Eric pointed out yesterday, we're not even sure we can build a platform we trust on the x86. So we're looking at other things and risk Five is incredibly attractive for that. I'm a little worried sometimes with the discussion because I, I see people get on and say, this is how you ought to do it because that's how we did it in Linux on the x86. And my view of RISC-V is there's still RISC-V around when nobody remembers what Linux was. Okay, so, so I see RISC-V living longer than Linux in personal opinion here. Um, so we need to be careful when we say the kernel does this, what kernel, right? I don't, you know, um, most of my work nowadays is not with Linux, it's with Acros. Um, or the config string is tough for the core to upstream. So we're thinking of actually either dumping the config string or not using the config string or having two strings because, you know, config string is actually a pretty nice idea. Um, it's really easy to wrap the config string in other things and, and create, you know, arrays of config strings and do a lot of good stuff. So uh, I just, um, this is kind of a request that we, we think really carefully about what we keep and what we throw out based on how we do things today. This, this should be a really long life architecture. Um, and key thing here is we've, I, I really want to ensure that we don't somehow make this VM thread model impossible because then we can't use RISC-V where I work. And that would be a damn shame in, from my point of view. So that's it. I'm trying to finish early. I think I did. Um, got any questions or comments or things I missed maybe? Peter Shu consulted. Um, so, is do you think there's any way to you know if you do virtual machine this way to do um, um, <clears throat> user mode I/O because you know using what I'm sorry user mode I/O in yeah. the virtual machine yeah because that's, they would know okay. about each other. Let me tell you about the IMMU and how awful it is. Um, so, I think that it'd be really nice if we could think about doing an IMMU that's not insane. And, and if you've used the Intel IMMU, you know exactly what I'm saying here, right? So um, yes, we were very interested in the idea that we could have a VM thread, again, this is the thing running in user mode, that has ownership of an IO device. And I'm particularly interested because of this idea of minion cores, which I think are a wonderful, wonderful idea. And so yeah, that, that's something we really want to think hard about doing. Um, Sam Falvo from the Kestrel Computer Project. Um, have, are you familiar with the start interpreted execution topics that have kind of come and gone on the mailing list by any chance? I've seen them and I'm not sure I understand them. Okay, you yeah. may want to get more involved with that because that okay. sounds like it's directly relevant with what you're looking for with uh, user level VM, uh, okay. thread, the thread level of VM implementations. Yeah. Um, just a suggestion. I, th I think you'll get a lot out of it or, or maybe even contribute back towards, towards okay. our understanding as well. Okay, that's a great idea. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Anything else for Ron? All right. The, the, only, the only request I'd make at the end then is uh, if you have some thoughts on what I've been asking about here or, you know, some ideas about how this can be achieved, I'm, I'm really open to it. That's one of the reasons I'm here today, to get some ideas. Thanks. <laughs>